This one's from Do Everything In Love. <laughs> You would know you're part of the biggest satanic cult there is. Disgusting. What satanic cult is that? And when did I join it? How big is it? What are the benefits and what are the meetings? Yeah, and a little bit like you. He in is, a wee. Yeah, in that what that he's a sort of a trickster, a prankster, a troublemaker, a mischief maker. Yeah, and a little you. bit like you. He in is, a wee. Yeah, in that what that he's a sort of a trickster, a prankster, a troublemaker, a mischief maker. The colour scheme chosen for the character is very significant indeed. Black and white checkered pattern. Hmm. Where have we seen that before? Here's the floor of a Freemasonic temple, all of which have black and white checkered floors. Russell, are you a Mason? Or do you know who you are? I'm not a Mason. I don't think you're allowed to be one if you've got a criminal record. <laughs> Hello there, let's talk about spirituality, particularly in the form of these tattoos. I got this tattoo done recently of Jesus Christ, the symbol of the resurrection, the possibility for divine God consciousness to be expressed through mankind. Whether or not you identify as a Christian, meaning you believe that Christ is the Son of God and that the Christian God would one particular branch of the Christian theology is the answer to the problem of being alive and dying and the Christ rose again. You know, for me that's a, not where I go with religion. Stop the media fakery. Russell, you're full of shit. Answer the allegations made by Willowear One about you appearing as a fake protester. Your mate David Icke is a well-known controlled opposition, along with Alex Jones. Time to come clean, Russell. Right, I'll a minute. I'm not fake. I want the same things you want. Peace and harmony. Is that what you want? ITM72, Mr. Brand. Firstly, expl... <laughs> Aggressive. Firstly, explain the number 33 tattooed on you in the wrist. You're a smart man and must know that it's colossal importance to Freemasonry. Well, it's not Freemasonry, actually. I'm not... You can't be a Freemason, I don't think, if you've got a criminal record. What to me it means, mate, is it's when uh, Jesus died, and I um, love a bit of Jesus. So, uh, it's as simple as that. Let's try some more Kundalini Yoga. After all, the material world's not working out for us, is it? Your job? Your constant pursuit of how's your father? Let's try something different. Kundalini, as I've already demonstrated, starts with a tune-in signal. 33rd degree Freemason Manly P. Hall explains the occult significance of the Kundalini serpent. Quote, that sleeping serpent power in man, which coiled head downward around the tree of life, drove him from the garden of the Lord and became the symbol of the Christ. The Pharaoh was an initiate of Scorpio, and the serpent is the transmuted Scorpio energy, which, working upward in the regenerated individual, is called the Kundalini. This serpent was the sign of initiation. It meant that within him the serpent had been raised, for the true Pharaoh was a priest of God, as well as a master of men. Hall also correlated the Kundalini serpent with the Garden of Eden. Quote, the tree that grows in the midst of the garden is the spinal fire, or Kundalini energy. The knowledge of the use of that spinal fire is the gift of the great serpent. Knowing this, it should be no surprise that Satanists take a liking to the concept of the Kundalini. On an openly satanic website, it states, The serpent or snake, which symbolizes Satan, represents the Kundalini at the base of the spine, also the DNA. The serpent represents life. When this force is activated, we are healed and enlightened. 
Satanist Aleister Crowley also believed in the power of the Kundalini energy. He spoke of, quote, the serpent flame and encouraged everyone to, quote, arouse the coiled splendor within you. This, it brings a lot of energy into you. Kundalini is energy that's already in you latent and some would suggest even energy that's elsewhere that when you open up certain meridians and channels in the body becomes accessible to you and flows through you. To conclude the exercise, we use the chant Sat Nam, which I was told and I've told you is a familiar, friendly name for the forces that some people call God. Sat Nam. Or a lot of the times I'll use the mantra Sat Nam. Pretty sure it means I am. I don't know, we learned it in Kundalini Yoga. Behind all material information, there is a sublime divine realm. We know this from, the, from quantum physics, mm -hmm. that all of the stuff that we can see emerges from a world that's harder for us to know with our material senses. Your consciousness lives inside of Wendy Williams, but it's connected to all consciousness. Now we must, we must uh, transform, become enlightened, right. so that we can access the next realm of consciousness necessary for our evolution. We are manifesting this reality, and it comes from thought, and from inner frequencies. Consciousness is an, a, a, an amorphous and expanding entity. I think that we allow our consciousness to be prohibited by our senses, prescribed by our senses, living in the realm of these five apertures into our reality. But reality is limitless. Space is infinite. I choose to believe in God because I think what that is is the recognition that there is divine beauty in all of us and if we prioritise that over our own selfish material needs then we will naturally create a culture more in harmony with our planet and we'll have a chance. You sound like a sort of new age prophet. Prophet, you know. A prophet, you say? Yes. Jon Snow there just said that I sound like a new age prophet. But it all for me seems like the same place we're all heading. We're all heading in the direction of oneness. We're all heading in the direction of love and meditation is an invaluable tool on facilitating that journey. That's why I meditate every day, and that's why you should meditate every day. The New Age movement is the modern-day popularization of occultism, which has been one of the main objectives of the Theosophical Society. In her book, The Key to Theosophy, Blavatsky stated that one of the primary means of building a global brotherhood of man would be, quote, to encourage the study of those laws least understood by modern people, the so-called occult sciences. The occult sciences, stated Blavatsky, helped develop and cultivate, quote, the hidden powers latent in man, thus giving him tremendous advantages over more ignorant mortals. The occult sciences include magic, mediumship or channeling, hypnosis, alchemy, and astrology, all of which are very popular in the New Age. You have multiple books in here on, on astrology, telepathy, and, and just various books on magic. The New Age Almanac notes the success of Blavatsky's endeavor to spread occultism in the West. Quote, several hundred new occult organizations can be traced directly to the Theosophical Society. For example, drawing upon the esoteric work initiated by Theosophy, ritual magicians have attempted to attain the mastery of the world through occult means, in a measure only hinted at in Theosophical circles. Theosophy also nurtured a reborn astrology. Beginning with minuscule astrological groups in the late 19th century, astrology made an astounding comeback to become the most pervasive popular occult practice in the latter part of the 20th century. Like the New Age movement, the primary aim of occultism is the pursuit of the expansion or evolution of consciousness and the attainment of Christhood through spiritual initiation. Occultist Rudolf Steiner is a perfect example of this idea, as a collection of his lectures is entitled The Evolution of Consciousness as Revealed Through Initiation Knowledge. Aleister Crowley, arguably the most notorious occultist and Satanist of all time, is an even more profound example of the occult roots of the New Age. Author Nicholas Campion sums up Crowley's New Age lineage and his influence in the development of New Age thought. Quote, there were two important currents of New Age prophecy in the 20th century West until the 1950s. One was embedded in the theosophical and esoteric tradition promoted by Alice Bailey, Rudolf Steiner, and Carl Jung. The other was magical, promoted by Aleister Crowley, and emphasized paganism and decadence. 
Crowley's vision of a new global religion, his understanding of all great prophets as manifestations of a single essence, and his desire to restore the West by teaching the East to the West mark him out as an heir to Blavatsky. Crowley's esotericism was by and large unoriginal. However, his most important contribution to New Age thought was to provide a statement of universal rights. Crowley's philosophy was fundamentally New Age. He propounded New Age ideas such as the following, quote, Happiness lies within oneself. Every man and every woman is a star, and the infinite unity is our refuge, since if our consciousness be in that unity, we shall care nothing for the friction of its component parts, and our light is the inmost point of illuminated consciousness. He believed that through meditation, quote, the consciousness of the many may be melted to that of the one, leading to the, quote, expansion of consciousness to that of the infinite, which, as I previously cited, was exactly how Alice Bailey defined the New Age initiation process. This is a clear sign that occultism, Satanism, and the New Age movement are part of the same spiritual phenomenon. And I love what you said about the evolution of the next consciousness. What's evolving is, is consciousness. Consciousness is the thing that's evolving, and it expands in every way it can. We are also granted the gift of experiencing an expansion within our own consciousness. Through the expansion of consciousness. We are moving away from this separation consciousness and moving into unity, oneness consciousness. The solar flares, the, the vibrational frequency is actually awakening all of us, and we're awakening as one. Because you are connected in consciousness to everybody. We need to come together in mutual acknowledgement that we're all the same consciousness having different experiences. The change consciousness is about oneness, unity of everything. Alice Bailey made it very clear that occultism was the source for her view of the Christ, and she believed that this New Age occult Christ would soon overthrow the Jesus of traditional Christianity. Quote, it can be expected that the Orthodox Christian will at first reject the theories about the Christ which occultism presents. At the same time, this same Orthodox Christian will find it increasingly difficult to induce the intelligent masses of people to accept the impossible deity and the feeble Christ which historical Christianity has endorsed. Occultism presents a Christ who is present and living, who is known to those who follow him, who is a strong and able executive and not a sweet and sentimental sufferer, who has never left us but who has worked for 2,000 years through the medium of his disciples, the inspired men and women of all faiths, all religions, and all religious persuasions, who sees divinity in them all and who comprehends the techniques of the evolutionary development of the human consciousness. These ideas the intelligent public can and will accept. Then the picture of a Christ demanding a unique position to the exclusion of all other sons of God will fade out in the wonder of the true apostolic succession in which many sons of God on different rays of differing nationalities and with varying missions are to be seen historically leading humanity along the path of divine unfoldment and nearer to God, the source. Occult or esoteric means that which is hidden or secret and refers to knowledge only known to the initiated. Occult teachings are usually associated with the idea of spiritual awakening, which is a very popular idea in the New Age. One becomes awakened when they have learned a hidden truth about the world and themselves, and thus they become initiated into the secrets or mysteries of the ages. We're moving into this new age of Aquarius, and it's going to be an awakening for everyone again. It's sort of an awakening that happens in consciousness. And I think that there is a more of an awakening. This great awakening is just about to take place. It is the awakening of the Christ principle in humanity. From, expanding. I was, I was expanding in more of a positive <laughs> awakening. direction. Yeah. yeah. There has been an awakening. Mankind's first awakening, according to the occult, occurred in the Garden of Eden, when the serpent revealed a great mystery to Eve that God had kept hidden from her, that she could become like God if she partook of the Tree of Knowledge. This was the first initiation. By eating of the Tree of Knowledge, Eve was initiated into the mysteries. She discovered her true identity and became God. This has been the foundational teaching in the occult and mystery schools for centuries that in the Garden of Eden, the serpent was the arbiter of mankind's initiation into godhood and imparted the ageless wisdom. 
This is what Madame Blavatsky meant when she stated that Satan, the serpent of Genesis, is the real creator and benefactor, the father of spiritual mankind, and that Satan can only be regarded in the light of his savior. Aleister Crowley similarly stated, This serpent, Satan, is not the enemy of man, but he who made gods of our race, knowing good and evil. He bade know thyself and taught initiation. Alice Bailey also confirmed that the roots of initiation are found in the Garden of Eden and the serpent's temptation to eat of the tree of knowledge. Quote, initiation leads to the cave where the secret of good and evil is revealed. This explains how the ancient mysteries or ageless wisdom has retained the same core body of teachings through the centuries because they have descended from the same spiritual father, the serpent. This is why the mystery schools, which are the ancient ancestor religion of today's New Age movement, worship the serpent as the bringer of divine wisdom. In Isis Unveiled, Madame Blavatsky confirmed that the serpent was the supreme god of the mystery schools. Quote, the hierophants, moreover, of Egypt as of Babylon, generally styled themselves the sons of the serpent god, or sons of the dragon, because in the mysteries, the serpent was the symbol of wisdom and immortality. Manly P. Hall, a 33rd degree Freemason and one of the most well-known experts on ancient and esoteric wisdom, also confirms the Christ-like importance of the serpent in the mystery schools. Quote, the initiates of the mysteries were often referred to as serpents, and their wisdom was considered analogous to the divinely inspired power of the snake. Among nearly all these ancient peoples, the serpent was accepted as the symbol for wisdom or salvation. Notwithstanding statements to the contrary, the serpent is the symbol and prototype of the universal savior who redeems the world by giving creation the knowledge of itself and the realization of good and evil. The accepted theory that the serpent is evil cannot be substantiated. It is the symbol of the reincarnation which was common to many of the ancient mystery schools. I think there's, you know, there's many efforts, you know, being done right now to try to bring things back in balance. There's more awareness. Um, uh, I've heard it referred to as being awake. You know, the awakening. The awakening where people are becoming aw more aware and beginning to um, take their own responsibility in how, you know, how their life is conducted or how, what they're in support of. You know, I just to share with you one really funny opinion. But there is a, in Lapland, there is a group of the in the shamans there who do something called collective dreaming. They will go together in seclusion and do the rituals with, the, you know, eating very little food and being in a, in in a, in a solitude for a long time. And they will go and dream the dreams. And the dream have to be collective same dream. So coming out of this dream, this once of the shaman told me that actually the best thing happened this, in this planet right now is the Trump to be the president. I said, how is this possible? Is the best thing to happen? <laughs> he said, yes, because because he's so irrational, he's so crazy. That's actually create that awakening that we finally wake up. Because before it will be another guy and another guy and everything looks similar, but he's so different than anything else. So the, actually, he's the the magician who waking us up. What do you think about that? <laughs> that kind of theory. As the modern day incarnation of the ancient mystery schools, the New Age movement worships the serpent both literally and symbolically. Perhaps the most blatant manifestation of this serpent worship is through what is known as the Kundalini or serpent energy the latent divine power believed to be lying dormant within each person. In the glossary to her theosophical devotional called The Voice of the Silence, Blavatsky defined the Kundalini as, quote, serpentine or the annular power on account of its spiral-like working or progress in the body of the ascetic developing the power in himself. It is an electric, fiery, occult, or phohatic power, the great pristine force which underlies all organic and inorganic matter. According to the New Age, the Kundalini, which Alice Bailey defined as the fire at the base of the spine, can be awakened through practices like yoga and meditation. And once it is aroused, the Kundalini then activates seven focal points of energy in the body, called chakras, as it is raised up a person's spine. Alice Bailey taught that the awakening of the Kundalini energy is a critical part of the New Age initiation process. In a treatise on white magic, she stated that when the Kundalini energy is aroused, it quote, correctly makes possible the final initiations into the consciousness of the monad or God. 
the Kundalini concept is essentially an occult metaphorical twist on the Garden of Eden account, with the notion of the serpent bringing the gift of God consciousness or divine wisdom. Professor John White, who has extensively researched the occult sciences of meditation and higher human development, comments on the Kundalini and its correlation with achieving godhood. Quote, Nearly all the world's major religions, spiritual paths, and genuine occult traditions see something akin to the Kundalini experience as having significance in divinizing a person. The word itself may not appear in the traditions, but the concept is there nevertheless, wearing a different name, yet recognizable as a key to attaining godlike stature. The Kundalini and seven chakra centers have been a central part of the mystery school teachings since ancient times. One Hindu esoteric author confirms this, quote, The ancient symbol of serpent in all the ancient mystery schools of the world is a codified secret symbol of the human vital energy flow channels represented in the physical body by the spinal cord, through which the vital life force, prana, in the form of a snake motion, moves in the chakras, vortex of energies. New Age author Daniel E. Mitchell claims the same, quote, There were seven levels of these mystery schools that taught Arat Sekum, which means the serpent power, it was about connecting with the seven energy points of the holy serpent fire of God within them while traveling upon the mystical path that leads to the awakening of the Christ consciousness. Describing what occurs when the Kundalini is awakened, New Age author Cindy Dale states, Our full physical and spiritual selves begin to merge. In Samadhi, all aspects of our true being, now fully activated by the Kundalini, can achieve a state of union with the Divine and empower us to become our real selves. Commenting on the rise in popularity of the Kundalini in America and the influence of Eastern spiritual teacher Gopi Krishna, Christian author John Newport writes, Gopi Krishna devoted much of his life to learning everything he could about Kundalini. He considered it the most jealously guarded secret in history and the guardian of human evolution. He believed it to be the driving force behind genius and inspiration. Gopi Krishna was eager to see Kundalini awakening cultivated, especially in the West. Since the 1970s, Kundalini awakenings have been reported with an increasing frequency in the West. Well, I, I believe there's a connection between the coronavirus and the, this movement that just started now for racial equality and so on. Um, the virus presented the enormous challenge for millions of people. And every challenge is an opportunity for waking up. And in the face of challenge, whether it's of a personal kind or a collective kind, uh, you, cannot, you cannot stay the way you are. You can go either one way or the other. So, so one way is a challenge makes you more unconscious. It pushes you into in deeper into ego, egoic reactivity and negativity and um, um, conflict with other human beings becomes magnified. So one way, one effect that a challenge can have on a human being is it can make him or her more unconscious, more reactive, more deeply entrenched in the egoic patterns. Uh, the other thing, on the other hand, a challenge can have the effect of forcing you to become more conscious. Uh, and uh, I have experienced it in my own life when faced with the challenges of life before I went through a kind of shift in consciousness when I was 29. Now, look, you've written a children's book, you have. Um, Russell Brand's Trickster Tales, The Pied Piper of Hamlin. It's your take on this uh, traditional tale. Yeah, that's right. Why did you do this for kids? Because I think that fairy stories mm -hmm. contain in them really important information that is difficult to get in any other way. Stories about community and duty and love that perhaps we don't receive in any other format. Plus, it was an opportunity to create the character of a Pied Piper who, uh, like Chris Riddell, the illustrator, yeah. he's just sort of himself a magical bloke. He's created this... This character here, right. for me, is irresistible and sort of terrifying. He's a bit like the Droogs from Clockwork Orange. So Russell's Pied Piper character, a children's book character, is, quote, a bit like the Droogs from Stanley Kubrick's film A Clockwork Orange. Yeah, and a little him. bit like you, he in is, a wee. Yeah, in that, what, that he's a, sort of a trickster, a prankster, a troublemaker, a mischief maker. 
Interesting description Russell gives here to confirm that the character is based on him. Let's listen to that again. Yeah, and a little him. bit like you. He in is, a wee. Yeah, in that what that he's a sort of a trickster, a prankster, a troublemaker, a mischief maker. He's a trickster, a prankster, a troublemaker, a mischief maker. Hmm. I believe in God. I believe God to be the limitless consciousness of which my own tiny little consciousness is but a part that beneath my identity as an individual, my biochemical reactions, my memories, my impulses is a witness and that this limitless witness is probably no different to what you feel. I believe, I believe that as they go deeper, deeper into the microscopic world, they will discover, hold on a minute, everything is one. It's all interconnected. It's all just one thing vibrating at different speeds or some sort of weird holographic revelation that we are bursting through a membrane into this frequency that the unmanifest is all about us waiting to be born. Now how does that relate to sort of the principles of religion or spirituality such as kindness? Well if we're all one we might as well be nice to each other. If we're all one there's no sense competing with one another. But godlessness, the belief that there or you know nihilism let's call it for like it's a less sort of um, divisive or troubling term. Godlessness leads to not a world, it doesn't feel right does it? A world of competition, of crushing, of artifice, of superficiality, the options that start to occur when you believe you are an individual in limitless space that began with a bang that was preceded by nothing that's flooding, sprawling into a limitless nowhere. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, after that, he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep.